We want to start in verse 14. And we'll go ahead and read on down to verse 20. And many of the brethren in the Lord, becoming confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing they had affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in that I do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now, so now also, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. <clears throat> all right. Um, let me just read my little paragraph here. <clears throat> Verse 14 confronts the modern-day Christian with an, an enigma. In this verse, Paul challenges their theology by stating that many of the brethren have become more confident by his bonds and are much more emboldened to speak the word without fear. Many who serve the Lord today would not become more confident by knowing that their leader had been thrown into prison and may soon be beheaded because of preaching Christ crucified. They would become more fearful, not less. So what is it that has caused this new release of confidence in these early believers? <clears throat> and it is, you know, it is an amazing thing how Paul sits in prison um, and yet uh, he is rejoicing, like verse 18 mentions the word twice, and he is confident and he is... Um, not just confident that God is alive or confident that God is going to deliver him, <clears throat> but confident in the, if I, if I may say it this way, confident in the method that he's chosen. That by going this way, there will be results. If a seed falls into the ground and die, it will, it shall bring forth much fruit. The problem is we see that in some sort of religious way where I'll do that. Uh, I, I'll believe in this way, this dying seed, this Christ crucified, this life out of death. doesn't matter what you want to call it. It's all the same thing. I'll go this way when it comes to if I get sent on a short-term mission trip or if I uh, am involved in an outrage or whatever. But if somebody crosses me, it's an interesting phrase if somebody crosses you. And where do you think that little phrase came from? When we say it, we go, you know, you know here's, here's me, and somebody crossed me. You know, you draw a little person, you draw a line to them, say, they, they cut across my grain, somebody crossed me. But I got a feeling that, I got a feeling where that came from, that it had to do with the cross, and it had to do and it had to do with someone hanging you on a cross. If someone crosses me, but here's what we say, if someone crosses me, I'll punch them out. You know? Because the whole meaning has been lost and the definitions have been changed and the boundary markers of the Lord have been moved. And you're not going to find them unless you go to the old paths. You're not going to find them unless you go back to the source who 
laid the boundaries. And this is the kind of thing that God says to Job and uh, Jeremiah and other, other places where he says, you know, I laid the boundary. I did, the, you know, or did he said, did you, did you lay the boundary? Well, clearly you didn't because you don't know where the boundaries are. When, when Job gets through to the end, he will. But at this stage, and in this process, God's bringing him to that. In other words, you'll find out that Romans 7 is probably your best friend instead of your enemy. But when you're truly in it, it's hard to understand where the boundaries are. Um, many of the brethren in the Lord becoming confident by my bonds confident oh this makes me more confident he's they got him chained up and in the dungeon man this is really making me confident and I feel much more bold to speak the word without fear wait a minute if your fear is bonds and imprisonment, if that's considered negative to you, if that's a setback to you, you're not more confident, are you? I mean, let's be honest. Let's just look at it for what it really is instead of being religious and read this stuff and never, you know, nothing ever really hitting us. We just go, yeah, well, yeah, praise God. I read that. What's it mean? I don't know, but man... I have read that. The Lord told me years ago, quit talking and try to communicate. Well, he hadn't got through yet, so don't thank him too much. <laughs> but he's working on me. So there is this, there is this, uh, I'm going to just say it, a, a super, natural release that has literally brought about a confidence that the brethren didn't have before. There is a boldness that someone who comprehends the cross has that someone who doesn't does not have. There is a fearlessness that someone, some of those who, as it were, using terminology here, bear the cross, that, that understand this way, they have a fearlessness that, that, you know, they are not afraid, you know, of certain things because those certain things are the actual means to fall out for the furtherance of the gospel. And if you claim to be a minister and you want to spread this thing, then you embrace those things. You don't run from them and pray them away. People think, you know, well, you're just, you're just stupid because you, you don't defend yourself or you won't write a rebuttal or you won't, uh, you won't do something to prove to other people that you're not what they say that you are. How, what a waste of time. Who are you? First of all, how many people you think you can convince with that? Second of all, the ones you would convince, if they were convinced by stuff over here and it wasn't true, being convinced by what you say now is just a switching of sides and they can switch sides that fast to a whole other side that comes along. Right? Yeah. Well, how is that defense different than the spirit of the world and anything they've ever seen? It's the same. It's the same as they know. It's, it's like when someone sees that which they don't understand that's different, that is Christ, that is the nature of God that's different, that is what stands out to people. It's that peculiar thing that doesn't make sense. And, and, that, and that flesh tries to constantly get it back to the thing that it understands and keeps beating at it and pushing at it. And it's like when it sees that that is from somewhere else and something else, it starts to recognize that, that that's different. And it, you're going to either have one of two uh, reactions to that. You're either going to try and kill it or you're going to receive it. Right. 
I think th I think what you just described right there is a good picture of of Paul. You know, we can call him the Apostle Paul. He's just Paul. He's just a man. I think that when he, you know, he was, uh, it, it, he, he said of himself that he was, the literal Greek there in Galatians is, I was out disting my brethren in this race, uh, in our religion, and, and that's what he called it, our religion. And um, he, clearly, he was one of those that sat at the feet of Gamaliel, which is one of the greatest Pharisees that, that ever lived, and a man that actually had some wisdom, although he didn't know the Lord, um, he heard about this Jesus. There is no record of him ever seeing the physical cross. But he heard Jesus died for others. Jesus, you know, the death of Jesus wasn't a tragedy. This is our message. This is our, and you know, see, that's how they received it. The first century saints, they said, the cross is not a defeat. This is the means. This is the greatest thing that ever happened. And, you know, they're all kind of going, what the heck are you talking about? Did you see what he looked like hanging on that cross? Do you know what he went through? Do you know the horror of what they put him through? And they would say, do you know the glory that has since come as a result of life out of death? Do you know how many people's lives have changed? Do you know what it's done to me? This is... See, that's, they didn't have a buildup of a bunch of weird doctrines that we call modern-day Christianity. They just knew this one, Jesus, and this is what happened, and this is our message. Okay. And again, they didn't preach miracles because they'd always had miracles. Or whatever, you see what I mean? I mean, the things that we as Gentiles, or, you know, as Gentiles go, oh, we never had miracles. Well, Jesus is going, we always had miracles. This isn't new, but this here cross, self-giving stuff, up there stuff's new. You didn't know there were Texas Jews, did you? <laughs> anyway, um, but I think still with what Shay said and commenting how that to me is a perfect picture of Paul, Paul heard all of that. He heard all that. He hung there, Father, forgive them. They know not what to do. But one day, one day, D-A-Y, literal day, one day he's standing there and they've got one of those believers, one of those people that believe that cross stuff surrounded and they got a mob mentality going. Do you understand? No, I don't think you do. Some of you might, but most of you don't. The mob men, I mean, when the mob rises up, they are, it's, it's a power all its own. And, and they rose up and they had one encircled and they were ready to stone him. And so they start throwing stones and Paul is sitting there holding their garments because he's a Pharisee, he's giving them permission. Kill these suckers. Kill these Christ and them crucified preachers. And the stones are hitting him. And he lifts up his eyes and he sees Jesus raised above, already went through death. <laughs> and he says the same words that Jesus said basically Father forgive them they know not what they do lay this not to their charge and now and his face it says his face glowed like an angel I mean, it was just just incredible and Saul of Tarsus Paul later to become Paul is watching this and now he is seeing a living demonstration of the message. Yes. <laughs> and I mean, rocks are hitting. You don't, you, you don't think Stephen was standing there going, that didn't hurt. <laughs> Go ahead, that don't hurt. You know, that's what we think is going to happen. He didn't do that. I think they hit him. I think there was blood. But I think he had his eyes on Jesus. And I think as he did, 
and he had to because at that moment all he's doing is exuding Jesus. So he didn't he didn't have his eyes on Jesus in some sort of a uh, visitation or uh, manifestation. You know, um, I forget what they they call it theologically, but uh, you know, pardon? Yeah, it's something. Uh, pardon? Theophany, something like that. But theophany was actually some sort of pre-presentation of the Lord before. So anyway, you know, look at, no, no, no. Because at, he is literally exuding Christ. Christ in what way? Christ the miracle worker? No. Christ the healer? No, he's not getting healed and he's not getting a miracle. Well, what's he getting? He's getting Paul. He's getting to Paul. He's getting to a man that will shake the world. I mean, I have heard, and I, you know, I tell this story from time to time, but I heard the story about this tent evangelist. Tent evangelist. And it was a little bitty tent. And he would travel around and he'd gather in a few people and stuff like that. And he went to this little town in, I think it was North Carolina, and he was preaching. And they, so a couple of friends uh, said, were in college, and they said, let's go out and just see this tent guy, you know. Let's just go see what this is about, you know. So they go out there, and it doesn't, you know, nobody ever really tells the story of the man that preached in that tent or the, you know, the power of God or the message or anything. They only remember one thing. One of those college kids' name was Billy Graham, and he went down front and he got saved. <laughs> how many, I mean, how many people did Billy Graham lead to the Lord? And this one little tent guy, maybe that's all he ever did. All he ever did? Maybe that's all Stephen ever did. Was affect the apostle Paul by the life and self-giving death of Christ. Not anything else. Not anything else. Had he asked for a miracle and gotten it, it would have voided Paul out. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. <clears throat> so I think that there is, uh, and, and I believe, I believe that if you're down in a dungeon and nobody sees you, nobody sees that selflessness, there's still that fragrance, that release of confidence, that release of boldness. It, it's called resurrection to others that you go into death and you say, I'm not going to grab the resurrection from me. Let it go to whom you will. Let the winds blow the fragrance to whosoever you will. I, I, I had a flash the other day. <laughs> Silly little flash. I had a flash that I had died and was, had been dead for like 10 years, 15 years. And you know, you know it's just a flash. It's kind of like a dream or something like that. And, you know, the great cloud of witnesses, you know, you're just sort of watching. And down here, a bunch of you were just, you know, preaching Christ. And people were, it's, it's like this place was so packed that we were having to, y'all were having to buy everything around it to fill it up with people. They were coming from all over the world to know Jesus. And, and, and uh, the, the sharing of the word was so rich and rolling over everyone. They were just going, oh, thank God. You know, and at the end of, you know, class instead of, oh, well, that was good, praise God. It was, they all falling on their knees and just going, hallelujah, we're hearing the, a voice from heaven saying it's Christ, you know. And, uh, and I, I saw a bunch of you standing around, and one of, the, one of you said to everybody else, I wish Randy could see this. He would love this. And the actual thought that came to me is, you know, I just love the death better. Amen. I know that sounds like I'm lying. I love it because I know what it produces. I love it because so many don't and so few are willing to go into it that I must love it and stay in it and, and receive it. And, and as I was in this 
whatever, dream or whatever, as I'm sitting there, my mind went back to all the death, to all the hard times, and I had a smile on my face. <laughs> and I, I was like, it was like a really glorious picture because it was like, oh, thank you, Lord. And it says that, that we are not only blessed, and guess what, I, that, oh, anyway, I'll get to it, but we are not only blessed to believe on him, but to suffer yes. with him. And, and I was just like, wow, what, what great memories. <laughs> you, know, and, you know, down here you kind of go, well, praise God. <laughs> but, you know, it was, and, I, and it felt right. It felt real. It felt like what it should be like, that good, good. You know, praise God for what's going on. Wonderful, wonderful. But my actual part was to be with Jesus in that way. And, you know, y'all were with Jesus in this way. You know what I mean? And that's gloriously wonderful and everything I would ever hope for y'all. That you would never have to go through that. That maybe there'd be enough death that y'all wouldn't have to go through that. And then, you know. But you know that you will, you, you can't just receive, you, you will have to go through stuff. It's got to, there's got to be a succeeding generation. There has to be. And a generation after that, and a generation after that, and somebody's got to keep it. But, but, you, but it's not, it is not, it is not preaching it. It is not because there is no release with preaching. Yes, there's a release of the Holy Spirit, and yes, there is a release of revelation. But if you're not in the right place, there is no release of of this confidence to and boldness without fear to face prison or death or whatever. Because that's what this verse is talking about. They saw what happened to Paul, and they still had a confidence and boldness to embrace it because they saw the benefit of embracing it by Christ's life or self-giving way. Does that make sense? Did that, was that clear enough? I hope so. All right. So we covered a verse. Uh, oh, we didn't. I've still got notes on the other side. <laughs> First of all, by Paul's self-giving, which has taken place, first of all, by Paul's self-giving, which has taken place by Christ in him, can't get amen, others have become partakers of a new wave of grace and confidence. Whoa, wouldn't we love that? This is in total accord with verse 7. Verse 7 says, Even as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. Do you see that? A, it is an ongoing reality. Um, uh, others have become partakers of a new wave of grace and confidence, which they wouldn't have had had Paul not gone the way that he did. This is in total accord with verse second, 7. Secondly, by Paul's example, they have received a view of the gospel that utilizes suffering, death, loss, negative circumstances, instead of running from them. Now, you've got to admit that right there in Acts 21, almost, or in fact, from everything we have, everybody that stood there during that little party, that little prophet party, when they were prophesying, they put the thing. Everybody had another view than what Paul had. Luke, and he, did, and he also talked about Paul's company. Luke was in that company, and so was Timothy and a bunch of them. But they, there was a big group. It wasn't small like what most people think. We don't have any of them speaking up and saying, wait a minute. Everything we're saying here, we're, we're building an atmosphere of fear and of um, uh, escapism. You know, wouldn't it have been neat if Paul had somebody that stood up and said, Whoa, hold it, hold it. Are, is, from this, is what you're saying is that 
Paul should run from this? Do you not even know the man? I mean, would he have liked that? <laughs> Do you not even know the man? Are you, how, you know, Luke, for God's sake, Luke, you're the only one that ain't a Jew. You should have got it. So he's the only non-Jewish writer in the New Testament. <laughs> or, you know, any of them. But they didn't get it. And Paul didn't make a big deal out of it either. Except, you know, he says, you know, you're breaking my heart with this, with this approach, the way you're viewing this. Don't you know that I will go into bonds and I will go into death for the Lord. So, let me say it again. Secondly, by Paul's example, they received a view of the gospel that utilizes suffering, death, loss, and negative circumstances instead of running from them. Paul says that affliction actually works for us. Now, I know you, keep your place in Philippians. I know that you know these two scriptures, but I want us to turn there. It's in, one's in 2 Corinthians 4. They're both in 2 Corinthians. So, uh, start with 2 Corinthians 4. And verse 16 through 18. Did I say 1 Corinthians? Thank God. 2 Corinthians 4. Verse 16. For which cause we faint not. Oh, there's a cause by which we won't faint. There's, is there a real cause for living and proceeding? But though our outward man perish, oh, okay, there is a decrease, isn't there? There always is a decrease. Don't, don't believe that the deeper life teaching that tells you that there can be an increase without a decrease. Don't believe it. Set. Paul said, I am set. Um, for the, which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Okay, so what is that saying, folks? That's saying that what you're going through is actually working a far more eternal and exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Is that what it's saying? How does that happen? Well, it happens exactly the way Paul's described in Philippians up to this point. He didn't say um, our light affliction will pass, but don't worry. God's going to bring a far more eternal weight of glory. Do, do you see the way I just said it as compared to the scripture? I said it like this. That suffering is one thing. But this over here, this is just God. God's going to bring us into glory. That's just something that just happened to you. Don't worry. You know, tie a knot at the end of your rope and hang on. You know, if you want to really hang on, make a noose out of it. Never mind. <clears throat> um, no, he's not. His approach is nothing like what I just described, where this is some sort of a separate sort of enemy thing, sort of a, well, here we go. The will of God be done. I resign myself to this. But don't worry. Our God's going to do big stuff, and we're going to get to go to the big dance. Does that sound familiar? That's kind of the way it's presented. He is literally saying this affliction is working for us to bring this about. Pray away the affliction. And you don't get the big dance. <laughs> People overseas are going, what is this? What sort of strange? It's American terminology. Maybe Texan. <laughs> Probably Texan terminology. <laughs> Okay, um, far more exceeding and eternal way to go, while we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. All right, 
what are these things that are eternal? What are these things we're looking at? I know what the things we're not supposed to look at. We're not supposed to look at the temporal. Don't look at temporal things. Well, don't look at the microphone and don't look at the chalkboard and don't look at the people and don't, I, I'm just gonna, so we say this, I'm gonna look at Jesus, okay? So, so we go, okay, well, then we grab the Bible. Okay, I'm going to look at, you know, folks, the things which are not seen, the things that are eternal, or the eternal spirit is the eternal nature and way of God, is the methodology that is the being of deity. So this is clearly, and I remember when, you know, it, it started being a, a radical, you know, it, the Bible says everything that can be shook will be shook. I remember when my religion, not my, not my sinful world or my sinful ways, my religion began to be shook, and I began to go, what, accept suffering? Uh, uh, utilize it for the glory of God? Even worse, are you telling me that going through junk by Christ releases something much greater? Yeah, it's called Jesus dying on the cross and resurrection, death and resurrection. Ever heard of it? Well, see, we all can say, yeah, I heard of it there. But I don't know if we think it's for us. If there's one thing the book of Philippians will do, it will convince those Philippians, Paul saying like this, I'm talking to you. Yeah. And they'll go, you, you, you talking to me? And he'll go, I'm talking to you. There's not going to be any doubt when he gets through. So, so the things that are eternal that we're supposed to look at isn't gates of pearl, streets of gold, mansions in the sky. You know, oh, anybody here ever seen the gate, the pearly gates? Huh? How are you supposed to look not at the temporal but at that? Okay. Oh, I think I'm... I think it's coming in. Let me tune in a little more. Oh, there they are. Cool. No, it's none of that. It is all wrapped up in this, and this is what he's saying. It's all wrapped up in this way of going through trials, going through persecution, going through affliction, going through it by Christ, not just with Christ. By Christ. Yes. One might even say that that way is Christ. Well, it is. It is. And that's, that's what we'll ultimately find out. You know, that's the big divider. Christ. He's the big divider. When it's not Christ, we tend toward the temporal. Now get ready. When it is Christ, you want me to say, we tend towards the eternal and then look skyward with a faraway look. Yes. No. When it is Christ, we tend toward the cross. This clearly is saying that. <clears throat> All right. Uh, and by the way, the, we are troubled on every side. We are persecuted. Those are just a few verses up from this. But he ends up talking about bearing about in the body uh, the dying of the Lord Jesus, bearing about in the body, bearing that the dying of the Lord Jesus in my mortal flesh, not 2,000 years ago. Is that, is that clear or just old hat? We're not talking about a cross of 2,000 years ago. We're, you know, forget what we're talking about. Paul, who wrote the Bible, the book we claim to follow, is not talking about 
the cross of Jesus on Calvary. We'll get into all that in the second chapter. He's talking about the cross. He's talking about Christ crucified. So ultimately, he's not even talking about the cross, nor is he talking about Christ. He's talking about Christ crucified. And that'll be a big point later on. <clears throat> All right. Still in 2 Corinthians, and moving as quickly as I know how, let's go to chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 9. This is Paul who... <clears throat> Uh, I'm not going to read it all up to this point, but beginning in the first part of chapter 1, he's come to a bunch of revelations. Okay? He didn't say inspiration or manifestation. He said revelations. Okay, so that's our pet word in deeper life. Revelation. Oh, revelation. I've had a revelation. You know. um, he's had all of that. But he ends up with this messenger of Satan that basically was sent by God and he prays and he says, no devil, no devil, no devil, no devil, you know, no. get this out of my life. I'm a son of God. I'm having I am coming to revelation. So we all know the more spiritual you get, the less problems you have. <laughs> well, that's a, that, that is a general, modern-day Christian concept, folks. And I'm proud of you for laughing, but, you know... It's, it, it, you know, Paul is admitting, man, he has really seen the Lord over and over and over. And now, and that's, this is what he's talking about. And now I've got this messenger of Satan and he is buffeting me. And I asked the Lord three times and I figured he'd listen to me because I'm his man in Revelation. You know, I'm the dude that sees. And then we get verse 9. He said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength, my grace, my strength, is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Well, I don't even know what to say to that. He has clearly stated that God said, no, I'm not taking your stuff away. I ain't taking your problems away. I ain't taking the devil away. I'm using every bit of this, that this is actually, it's the devil for God's sake. You ever said that? Well, that's this the devil. It's just all out the devil, a, 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 a satanic attack on me. Lord, take it away. <laughs> huh? Anybody ever felt that? Or, you know, I've come to revelations. Now, I know you're going to take it away. Because I'm asking. And he says, no. He goes, no, no, no. All right, so then the, the proper response to that isn't, well, I'll just find me another God. Or, well, if this is really the way you are, I don't know if I want to serve this kind of God. The proper response is, then why, Lord? Why? I mean, I need to understand your way. I, I don't want to just resign myself to your will. Your will is no, I'll put up with the devil. I don't want to do that, Lord. I 
don't want to survive. I want to be an overcomer. So you're going to have to explain to me why. Well, God loves explaining the why of this type of situation because this is exactly the heart of Christ and him crucified. This is the very thing that out of your coming to weakness, out of, you know, me allowing this, there's going to be a new release of Christ. You will decrease, and he will increase. But why will you decrease? Why, why does Paul... It's one thing to, to acknowledge that and say, okay, I resign myself to that. It's another thing to take pleasure in infirmities and necessities and persecutions and all that. Am I, am I right? It's a, that's a whole other ballgame when you start saying, I take pleasure in that. You know, what is it? You know, is he a masochist? Hit me with your best shot. No. No. He comprehends the way of the Lord. He comprehends it. He comprehends Christ crucified. Not Christ, not cross. We're talking Christ crucified. And he gets it. And he turns. And he moves from a place of defense with shields you know, holding the enemy at bay, but falling and barely holding on. Anybody felt like that? He, moved, he leaves that place. And he does it willingly, and he does it with the Lord, not just for the Lord. And he says, I see the benefit. Remember, it's this exact same letter that he said, this affliction works for us. It's working for me. By, by me going down into death, my soul going into death, Christ is coming forth. And now I have a strength that I didn't have when I was just resigning myself to the will of God. I am now with him initiating the will of God. Does that, is anybody getting this? Yes. No, you're not. <laughs> yes. If you go back to John 4, 24, I think we've all seen it. Like, the seat, the seat is down on the ground. It's got to go through the pressure, pressure. And things it has to be crushed before it can be the fruit. But what we've got today is most people are going to put your seat in the ground and skip that part and just bear fruit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and that is, sorry, sorry. So it sounded like our brother. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's actually our personal brother, also. Yes. Exactly. Okay, how many minutes we got? Uh, six. You know, we just, we just. Of course, it's only nine right now. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's, let's look at verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. All right, so we got two categories of those who preach Christ. Right? Two categories. Uh, some preach Christ in strife and in contention, and others are preaching Christ out of goodwill. All right. Who are we going to accept? Well, only the ones who preach Christ out of goodwill. If you're not sincere, if you're not really have a heart for God, I don't trust you, sucker, and I will not, you know, put my stamp of approval in any way, shape, or form on you. But look at what Paul says uh, in verse... Uh, uh, 16, the one preached Christ of contention, let's see, the one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in that I do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. 
What is the deal with this guy? He is totally the opposite of the way most Christians are. You know, instead of calling out the bad guys, you know, because after all, isn't this really about good and evil? We're the good guys, and they're the bad guys. Isn't it strange how everybody is the good guy? I mean, ask the bad guys. And they'll tell you who the real bad guys are. It's you. See? And that's just every, way, every man's what, way is right in his own eyes. Yes? Uh, I mentioned this in my class the other day, but um, I had a friend who went, uh, was going to his church, and he was a, did not agree with anything the preacher said. So I asked him, I said, well, why are you going? And he says, because it gets me in work. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah me too. I've... Boy, I've read books, I've sat in services uh, where, you know, the, the biggest mess of stuff is being preached. And I have had the Holy Spirit open the word to me in such special, special ways. Um, because I went into the service going, Lord, I, I need to hear from you. I want to hear from you. It's not about right or wrong here. It's not about what he's preaching it's about me having the right spirit and believing that i can get something out of this service <clears throat> all right so uh, i've got a question here what is our reaction to those who preach and minister in a manner that only adds affliction and misery to the already heavy burden that we now carry for jesus well do we want to get on Facebook and say bad stuff about them? Do we want to get people on our side? Folks, we don't have a side. There's Jesus and there's that which is not Jesus. Where, what category do you fall in? <laughs> you know, are you one with Jesus? Or are you, you know, in the name of religion, ready to kill others? You know, we go, well, those dead, burn, Arab terrorists, in the name of religion, willing to kill other people. Well, that's what we're doing. We're, ki you know, killing their reputation or killing their financial support or killing the, by raising up, saying junk and putting it out there. And, you know, we're, but we're doing it, we say we're doing it to defend the truth. We're trying to defend ourselves. We're, you know, Jesus stood before his accusers, like a lamb sled to the slaughter. They sheared him, and it said he opened not his mouth. He didn't justify. What does that mean? Oh, baby, because the, the justification that you could raise might be what, it's not even a resurrection, but it might raise the situation on your behalf maybe just a little bit. Maybe you can convince seven people that you're really this isn't about you it's not even on their side it's not about you they think it's about you but it's not about you it's about light and darkness not good and evil and it's about Christ and uh, I, I love the way that this scripture presents these people I love it I love it because it is, it is so pure. It is so pure in its explanation of exactly what they're doing. See, because all we catch is some preach Christ of strife and contention. And so we, you know, we're, you know put up your dukes. Come on, come on. Fight you one more. Never mind. Yes. Things. One is we forget how bigger God is and that he is able to turn things around or whatever. But actually, we could need to put them in his hands and let him take care of that. It's not our business. That's God's business. That's really not our business. But we think it's absolutely, yeah. totally our business. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you. No. 
Yes. Oh, one thing that, that reminds me of is, doesn't the Lord say that vengeance is his? So if, if, if we're really going to be defended or, you know, on anyone's behalf, God is going to be the one to, to do it. I mean, if vengeance is his, it's not our business to strike those people. If they're to be struck down, he'll strike them down. If that's, you know, what he really wants to do. Right. But, I mean, we shouldn't be worried about taking vengeance or being justified in their, uh, you know, it's not about that at all. No, it's not. Well, and here's that sweet presentation that um, causes you to understand the real issue here. He says, verse 16, the one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, here it is, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. Okay. So... Uh, and in verse 18, he says, What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in that I do rejoice, because they are bringing a cross. They are bringing a, a, an, an intentional thing, supposing to add affliction to your, the fact that you're already in prison and stuff, and you are not defending that, in fact, you're embracing it and saying another way to go into the cross to bring forth more life. You are not just, you know, you're not just passively going through it and saying it's Jesus not to fight back or whatever. You are embracing the moment, the situation, the, 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 the category. Um, because remember, later on he says, whether by life or death, all I have ever wanted to do was that Christ would be glorified in my body. Does that make sense? And so we have to see the true issue there isn't just two sides, good and evil, isn't just somebody uh, picking on us, but by doing what they're doing, they have opened the door to Paul for him to say, this is more ground, more death, more cross, more reality and they're not adding affliction to my situation they're adding a, a, an element that will help me release Christ yes yeah. we were talking it's memory that his word will never come back void and even if it's presented not in the right way the spirit can still let you receive it or somebody else receive it in the right way. Um, and so even if the whole attitude is wrong when they're presenting his word, he doesn't allow it to come back. Amen. I wrote uh, verse 16. And, and verse 18, bring to light the human supposition that this opposition is adding extra affliction to Paul's already miserable state of confinement. But from verse 18, we discover that Paul is not moved negatively by either method, for to him all things work together for the good of conforming him to the image of Christ and for the good of life out of death and releasing and remember this is part of that whole thing where the brethren are uh, more confident and much more bold to preach Christ this is the this is the wood this is the fuel that's being added to him in prison extra fuel dumped on and he's lighting that fuel and he's embracing it and he's going down into the, and he's going see they're they're supposing you know, they're supposing that they're adding more affliction to this situation, and they have no clue that they're actually opening the door for a greater release of Christ, and it's going on right now. So whether in contention or goodwill, I thank God for both of them. Yes. That's what I was going to say. It was that. <laughs> Just it's, like that. In the, letter, in the letter, you can sense, you can sense what well, he says. For me to live is Christ, and to die, you can sense the joy that's sparking up the more that we read. 
because he's encouraging them in, in a whole different view. It's a whole that's different exactly way. Right. And it's like encouraging to yes. the spirit that's in. Yes. And it's just when he says, for me to live is Christ. Don't go too far ahead, but yeah. you got it. You got it, girl. That's he, He's, by the time he gets down there, he has got both barrels loaded and he's ready to, you know. <laughs> Well, he is, because from verse 1, remember? Do y'all remember verse 1? Anybody remember what we talked about? Oh, man, verse 1 is nothing but this same thing. It was a little tiny seed of all of this, and he's never skipped a beat yet, and he won't, he won't all the way to the end of the book. He is a man on a mission. He's got something to say. He's got something from God, and he knows that the Philippians don't have it. They are relating to God. They are brethren. They are in the family. They are saved. All those things are settled. He's not worried about that. He wants them who have received uh, the benefit of him going into death and of Jesus going into death. They've received all the benefits, and now he's trying to make them grow up and come to a whole new level. All right, let's stop. Father, we just thank you for your word and your spirit. And Lord, um, may this be more than classes. May somehow uh, you break the bread of life to us. May we commune, Jesus, with you in the cross. Uh, may we May we bring, may it bring to our remembrance that self-giving way of you at the cross when we eat these elements before you as we, we have communion in, this, in these uh, gatherings and in these classes. Father, we long after you, we hunger after you, and we see that you, you had a man set before us. His name was Paul, and he is declaring with everything, every fiber of his being, something that overrides all other truths and brings us into a reality that we can't know by knowing. We can only know by, by your son being that revelation of that thing. So, Father, we ask you to continue to bring us uh, until the, to the places that you desire in this class. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.